Welcome, everyone. As he said, thank you for uh, introducing us. I'm Amelia Weeding, and I'm joined here by my friend Dave Bailey. And we're here to talk about some research that we did because we wanted to learn how to hack IoT better. So welcome to our talk, Hell Zero Degrees World. So quick overview, go through our intro. What's the Internet of Things? What are the attack surfaces we're looking at? What are some hacker tools? And we got some live demos. So who am I? I'm Amelia Weeding. I'm a staff embedded hacker. I work on embedded systems throughout the day. And I'm a SOC goon. I'm a badge maker. I've made badges for a few years at DEF CON. And uh, I do a lot of other stuff. So Dave? Sure. So as Amelia said, my name is Dave Bailey. Um, by day job, I'm a senior staff embedded hacker. Um, I uh, volunteer at various events around the Des Moines area. And um, I've also worked on a couple badges as well. Um, if you're familiar with the Pico Duck project, that's, the, that's my project. So Amelia, what's the Internet of Things? Well, NIST has an explanation, but I'm not going to read it. But uh, you've got consumer IoT with televisions, mesh networks, lights, speakers, security systems, home appliances, ovens. Ovens? I mean, I got to preheat my oven on my drive home, right? That makes yeah. sense. Uh, locks, garage doors, pet feeders, water bottles, my coffee cup, Dave's neighbor's washing machine. So everything's connected, right, Dave? Yep. So if you think about you know, things, we'll go through an example here. I, I'm sorry. IoT cameras, you would connect them up to the internet, which then they have the firmware and hardware. You see them on your home computer. Again, a bunch of firmware, software, stuff running on them. You might be able to see them on your handset. So, and of course, there's a cloud server. I'm sure that's fine. And then the ad servers that come along with it because, you know, everybody likes to have those on them, I'm sure. So one of the things that Dave and I like to do is we like to look at the attack surfaces. And this one I will read. The attack surface describes all the different points where an attacker could get into a system and where they could get data out. Uh, I added that data out part because a lot of times with advanced persistent threats, it's about sitting there and waiting and exfiltrating data when you have the opportunity. And with the built-in capabilities of these IoT devices today, we find that they have Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, GPS, GLONASS sometimes, NFC, they have new technologies that you've never heard of. They have old technologies that you wonder why they're using them. Has anyone ever used a flipper on a Tesla? For some reason, they control relays, valves, sensors, cameras. Uh, Jack Reciter's got a pretty good Darknet Diaries episode where he talks up, where he has a guest that talks about industrial hacking of like Internet of Things industrially. There's also remote configuration, data storage, push alerts, mobile apps, and even more different ways that you can interact with your hardware. I mean, you might not know how that device pairs with your phone, but it just hooks up to that weird shady Chinese app. Yep, so we're gonna to talk to now about a couple of real world examples and then talk about the research that we did. So probably most of you are, are familiar with this. We like to bring this one up because it happened here in Las Vegas um, where you know there was actually someone connected their internet fish, fish, or connected their fish tank to the internet and then because it was on, rather than a segmented network, it was on their network, they were able to pivot and use that device to get in onto the casino network, which is kind of crazy. Yep, and it's still a problem today. So that brings us to the meat of our talk. So we kind of rushed through the opening because we have a, a lot of research that uh, we've done together and some demos we want to share with you. So why is this called Hell Zero World? Well, uh, where Dave and I hail from, it gets to be pretty cold outside. And you can see there the outdoor temperature is negative two degrees Fahrenheit there. And, and I purchased this weather station off of Amazon, sight unseen, no reviews, brand new online. And it's IoT capable. I can control it from my phone. I can see what the weather is at home. I can see what the weather is outside. It's internet connected. It's got undocumented Bluetooth, we found out, for the setup and management of the platform. It's also got a 433 megahertz radio so that it can read those weather sensors that you put outside. And it didn't have an FCC ID on it. And I'm wondering what the heck is going on here? So who saw it? Yeah, anybody notice the temperatures on the previous slide? That's the... Uh, makes like Las Vegas look cool. Yeah, it makes it look like it's a, it's a what is it, a blizzard outside here. 
So it's incorrectly displaying the weather forecast. It can't, it can't display low temperatures for some reason. We don't know why. We dumped the firmware. We're still trying to figure out exactly why it does that. But if you'll notice the high of uh, 32 and the low of 177, that's kind of funny. <laughs> so when does this happen? Uh, I started playing around with the device. I noticed that when I switched it into Celsius, the zero degrees showed up, but then it underflowed to 155 there that you see in the bottom right hand corner. And then in the top image, you can see that it goes from 32 to 191. So it's obviously doing its math in Celsius and then converting it to Fahrenheit. But why does it happen? We're going to figure that out later on. But um, you rely on these devices, right? You might rely on this for telling you the temperature of a freezer or to tell you whether or not you have to get home sooner or later because your pipes might freeze. Would you rely on this for the weather or would you rely on this for security? I know I wouldn't. I unplugged it as soon as I saw it when the temperature started dipping below zero. So what else was here, Dave? All kinds of fun stuff was in here. So the first thing we did was, of course, open it up because that's what you do with IoT devices. And we found this interesting chip. Um, so if anybody's familiar with the, the Tuya brand of, of IoT devices, this is what we found in there, um, the CBU module. And they, um, you know, we were able to through that find some a bunch of data sheets. There's a lot of good information from Tuya on just how you connect over, over the serial line. But they didn't talk anything about other stuff on there. They also randomly decided to get rid of a uh, transistor and just put a zero resistor on there. I just wanted to point that out because I thought that was funny. So I sent Dave the data sheets. Yep, yeah, so we were looking at the data sheet, so we were able to get the pin out on this very nicely. Um, thank you to, it, to you. They talked a little bit, again, about their, their uh, protocol over the serial port, so we could start reading a little bit of data, what was coming in and out of it. Still didn't make a lot of sense yet on it. But we did find a few other projects related to, to some Tuya things and said, hmm, interesting. Well, why did we look at the port, Dave? So we, of course, and mapped it because it's a, a network connected device. So of course you do that. And we found this port, undocumented port on 6668. No idea what's going on on that port. Like I said, they're looking through online stuff. There's a handful of people looking at, at potentially what's in that, in that port. Um, but nothing about weather stations on any of that research, so it's kind of interesting. Yep, and that is a typo. It does say 6888 because when I took the screenshot, I was trying other ports on other two devices to try and figure it out, and that's just the screenshot that made it in here. So at this point, we had enough data for me to break out the tools on my workbench. Uh, we used that pinout that we identified to see that there was a UART 0 and a UART 1. And on UART 1, it was just spitting out all sorts of text. Uh, just plain text, debugging messages while it's booting up. I mean, to the point where we even found some what we later found out were secrets in there. Uh, we soldered the jumpers of the UART serial pins because I didn't have my PC bike kit yet. And honestly, it's nice to have the wires on it because even to this day, we can still control it over the UART. Uh, we utilized the Flipper FTDI. I found that the grounding on the Flipper was a lot more stable than it was on the Tigard, but they did both work. Uh, and I did use an open source tool called BK7231 Tools to dump the firmware, and it successfully act uh, pulled the firmware really easily. And so, um, turns out you can get x-rays. We were trying to figure out what was going on with the LED LCD controller on it, and unfortunately our x-ray tech missed that one chip that we wanted. But we thought we would share some of the pictures we got, because uh, my soldering job is actually uh, the one on the top that looks nice. The one that came out of the factories are the ones on the bottom there. So, um, and there's actually some of those wires are just traces under the board that they just said, hey, screw doing an air wire, let's just auto connect it. And then over in the bottom right, that's the 433 megahertz uh, transceiver that can send and receive data. And uh, up here, you can see kind of how the wires were connected when we opened the board, because these were our wires. They, they pulled a couple of the wires off when they were doing the x-rays. Uh, but yeah, you can see where our wires are and where their wires are and how much nicer ours are. And then even the traces under the board, that was pretty cool to see. Um, so then we dumped the firmware. And Dave goes, hey, Amelia, can I have a copy of that firmware? And so I say, sure, Dave, you can have a copy of that firmware. And Dave says, 
Hey, Amelia, I know your Wi-Fi password now because they, they manage in, the, in, in this. So this is from the firmware dump. They actually dump a JSON file that uh, has a bunch of information about the, the, the firmware on there, but it also persistently stores things like the Wi-Fi, SSID, and password. Now, you know, they're not plain text, plain text, but that's just base64 encoding. So which is pretty obvious if you look at it on the on the password field, the double equals is like that's immediately how I how I told Amelia how I found it is because it's like double equals kind of gives it away as padding in base64. So it's very much like, oh, hey, I know your password. And she's like, really? Uh -huh. And now my IoT network is called fake news. <laughs> So uh, we took the binaries that came out, uh, we dumped them using um, Binwalk, figured out what was there and started going through Ghidra with it. Uh, one of the fun adventures I had here was a block of IP addresses that I found. I'm not sharing them right now because I don't want to dox any of the providers, but we found several major providers IP address blocks that allowed us to have direct access to the web servers of over a thousand different customers of that cloud provider to the point where I even found like a CMDB in there by just scanning zero slash 24 on an end map. Uh, it, it was pretty trivial to find this stuff. And, and then of course we found our passwords in there. We found keys for connecting up to the service. And more importantly, we found the keys encoded in an interesting AES style that Dave's gonna explain in a second that allowed us to gain some more um, access to the device. So that's uh, the, the dump of that uh, bin walk there. So, um, Dave says, go ahead and netcat to the port. Yeah, so, you know, of course, open port, what do you do? You connect with netcat first thing just to see what's in there. Also, we noticed that the data is coming back in an interesting format. So it's like, hmm. So we end up actually dumping it through, uh, uh, through some other uh, things and determined that it's actually just some, some ASCII data coming back. And again, if you, if you think back a few slides where they were talking about the Tuya stuff, they had some you don't, you don't need to go back to it, it's way far back. Uh, but, but I they had some, it. Um, but they had some, this one, that was that one, where they talk about these header blocks in there, so the 55AA, they're like, oh, that's interesting, because we saw that right in the, in the slides, that were, in, the, in the data that we were seeing over the network. And it's like, huh, I wonder if that's similar to the, to the data that we're seeing, and it was, but it wasn't the same, because the data on the serial port was, uh, kind of encapsulated, but this was actually a little bit encrypted. And so we actually had to go and try and find those keys to try and figure out how to, how to decrypt the main block of this, uh, of this protocol. But as you can see in there, we managed to, to find the keys and decrypt it. Um, and as Amelia said, what was really interesting when they dumped the keys, um, if you, in that JSON file that we showed you, one of the things in there um, that we didn't dump out in, in our slides here is the local key that they use to, in, to encrypt this data. But if you look at it, you're thinking, okay, they're using AES, we found that in the code, they're using AES-128. Um, of course, they're using ECB mode because, well, whatever. Um, but we were looking at it and it's like, but there's only eight bytes worth of data of key. So what do they do? Do they pad it? H how do they generate the AES key? No, actually what they did is that they have an eight byte uh, AES key that then they take the ASCII for each character in the eight bytes, and that's your 16 byte key. So. And then that led to him giving me the proof of concept to write a console that allows us to just send messages to the device. So we just tell it what IP address it is. We tell it what kind of command we want to send to the device. We hit enter, and you can see here, I'm changing it from Celsius to Fahrenheit from my VS code terminal. And then it turns out, if you go and you take that and extrapolate the data bytes versus the control bytes, we figured out what was the alarm, what was the clock, we started figuring out what was the temperature, and, and then I figured out a way to uh, fuzz it. So we ended up fuzzing it, and as we were fuzzing it, I started getting alerts on my phone. And then the next week, Dave was fuzzing it from his house, and I was getting alerts on my phone. <laughs> So every time you see the HH there, or the LL, that's literally sending an IoT alert to my cell phone. And then you see there, completely turned off the backlight. At one point, the thing started screeching uncontrollably. Just like, it just sounded like a banshee, like it knew that I had, I had touched it in a bad way. Yep. Yeah, so we're gonna do a couple demos here on the, on the device. So um, we're gonna try and get the, the screen 
visible up, up on here. Um, but over the network. So we have a Wi-Fi network set up here, and Dave's running some code to yep. connect to it. It's so I can, is it on the network? Yep, we're good. So cool. from there, I just changed it over the network, so over Wi-Fi from my laptop to, to the device. Yep, you want to do that again so they can, they can watch. So see how it's in Celsius right now? And now it's in Fahrenheit. Yep. So that's being controlled by a console over here. Yeah, so I have a, so just a console app that I wrote that can, uh, it sends those encrypted messages over, over the network to, to the device and I can change a bunch of things on it. Um, and then it actually reads back and gets data back from the device so if as I well. So change one of the things on here. See there, I hit the alert button right here. Yep, so, so we change, if we hit, we, well, that's one thing we noticed is if we started hitting button, buttons on there, we got messages over the network from the device. And that's actually what started us to try and decode them. And then we realized as we were receiving them that we could send, which was really interesting that we could send over the local network to the, to the device and be able to, to, uh, to be able to control it. But one of the fun ones that we have is, uh, you know, we're in Vegas. We all want a drink, right? It's gotta be five o'clock somewhere. Yeah, it's gotta be five o'clock somewhere. Why don't we make it five o'clock here? Oh. <laughs> all right, go grab your drinks, everyone. <laughs> and so now that you're scared of the IoT, we got some recommendations for you. Segregate your IoT networks. Follow the FBI's uh, regulation or uh, recommendations there. Physically segregate them. Do not make it a VLAN. Make it a physical separate network. Use strong passwords and securely dispose of your IoT devices. This is something that we didn't see in the OWASP recommendations or the CISA recommendations. But if someone went through your garbage and grabbed one of these and went and sold it at a pawn shop or something, there goes your IoT network password. Uh, if you're a business, track your assets have a documented incident response plan. Make sure you update, 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 unless you have a specific Samsung washer, then don't. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> so what's next? Yeah, so we're gonna continue to try and reverse engineer on this. We're still trying to figure out if we can dump the keys without actually having to, to uh, solder into it. But this, this GitHub link is our uh, code that we have so far on being able to talk to this Tuya device. Um, we think it should work on other ones as well, but definitely on these weather stations, um, that's what we've tested it on so far. Um, and then we're gonna keep working to see, like I said, other Tuya devices, and we're just gonna keep having fun with this, with this device. And that's my cat, Nicola. I needed another picture. Yep, we're good. Thank you, everyone. Any questions? Thank you, great talk. Uh, did you do responsible disclosure to Tuya and what was the response? I've had some interface with them. I'm curious to see what your response was. We got set up as OEMs with the plain text of we are cybersecurity researchers who have pinned down to your circuit board and have reverse engineered your platform. Let us know when you want to hear our findings and we haven't heard anything back. But they sent us OEM devices, so we're good there. Yeah. <laughs> well, well done, well done you guys. So my question is, did you reverse the firmware to figure out why it wouldn't display negative temperatures? That was on our list to do too. We kind of got distracted with some of this other stuff, but we do want to get back to the firmware. Uh, okay, I was just it is, it is patched in the latest version. So once we got registered as an OEM, we were able to order a sample of this exact weather station, but it turned out that the circuit board is version 1.3, not 1.2, and that one has it patched. So we can actually do a diff between the two firmwares now and figure it out. We just have day jobs and other things going on in our lives. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah the other, the but other if you thing, wanna help us figure it out, we'll, we'll happily post the firmware. Yeah, the, the other thing with the firmware is that they've stripped all the symbols, so it's really a pain in the butt to try and debug some of this stuff on it. Well, maybe we should uh, strip our keys out and post a copy of the firmware. Okay. So. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.